awesome. <laughs> I love that. It takes me back to my 80s, growing up in the 80s. I think I played way too many video games in the 80s, and, and some, something about that, like, I don't know what video game that was. Anybody reminded me of, like, Tempest. That, that's it. I was wanting to say Tron earlier. Also a very cool 80s video game, but has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today other than those games were all awesome. So I just like saying that. Uh, quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you would say that relationships are more important than success? All right. How many of you say people are more important than possessions? All right. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a redundant, like, yeah, of course, those are, those are things that we would all say yes. Typically, most people on their deathbed would not say, oh, man, I wish I spent more time at the office. I wish I would have acquired more. You know, right? We, we hear people say, man, I really wish I would have invested more in my relationships with my family or those closest to me. A lot of times, we have relationships maybe that went sour, friendships that have gone bad, marriages that have ended uh, poorly. And uh, many people would say, boy, I, I wish that the relationships in my life were better. And if that's the case, I mean, I, I think most of us would, you know, hope that we would have relationships that are awesome, that are, that are great, that are life-giving and fulfilling, because we're relational creatures. That's how God designed humans to be. So look around. See, if, did you come with a human in here today? If you came with a human uh, or you know another human then humans need good relationships. That is a part of healthy living. And that's what we want to talk about. Uh, Jesus says this, what's, Im what's important in life, uh, if you want to have an abundant life, is this. He said, you must love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the first and the greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as who? as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And Jesus is saying that everything in the Bible rests on these three relationships. You got God, others, and relationship with yourself, right? Love God, love others as you love yourself. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit today. So if we want to have awesome relationships, all right? It starts with us. So go ahead and point to yourself and say, me. It starts right here. If I want to have great relationships in my life, it starts right here. And so one of my favorite authors, a guy named Bob Goff, he's a really crazy uh, communicator. If you ever get a chance to hear Bob Goff, don't miss, that, uh, don't miss that opportunity. But he says, we could all have a great mission statement for our lives in two words. Be awesome. <laughs> very, very simplistic, but this is not a mission statement for others to say, hey, you be awesome so that I can have great relationships. I need you to be awesome so that you can fulfill me. Instead, it's like a t-shirt that we wear underneath to remind ourselves we are the ones who need to be awesome. We are the, the contributors to our relationship. And so uh, the next several weeks, that's what we're going to do here at Community is we're going to talk about relationships and how we can contribute to relationships in a way that makes them more fulfilling, more meaningful, and more what? Awesome. <laughs> uh, so funny to say that. Now, today we're going to talk about one of the relationships uh, in particular that is really close to a lot of you. Uh, it's marriage. So how many of you, out of curiosity, are married currently in the room? All right. How many of you are not married in the room? Okay, so fair number. So if you're, you're, you know, some of you are like, oh, great, they're going to talk about marriage. Not awesome. I, I, like, I don't want to hear about that today. But here's my promise to you. What we talk about in this message today, I think you can apply to other relationships in your life. So maybe it's relationships with friends or your work relationships or your family relationships. A lot, all these principles apply across the board. But I am going to pick on the married people today. So I'm coming at you, married people. All right. I want to give you some encouragement. We want to focus on this specifically because marriage is really difficult. Marriage is hard. 
And marriage is something that we need to talk about because God wants our marriages to be awesome, even if they're not. And, and maybe you're coming in here today and you're saying, oh man, my marriage is so not awesome that I really want to encourage you today. And maybe you're coming in and your marriage is awesome and you're thinking, man, I don't know how my marriage could get any better. If that's the case, uh, then stick around after service. We'll have people come hang out with you. Um, <laughs> because that would be fantastic. You can kind of share some of your awesomeness with them. But uh, yeah, and, and honestly, I would love, if you're not married, just during the service at some point, if you're a praying type person, to say a prayer for people who are married, because marriage is so tough, and marriage is not always awesome. Here's, here's a video about some of the things that couples tend to argue about. Uh, so true. So out of eight different things mentioned, how many of you are like, yes, uh, toilet paper, toothpaste, uh, you know, all those things, how you roll the towels, crazy. Uh, how many of you seriously are still arguing about the toothpaste? Any, any couples? You, are, you guys argue about the toothpaste? Okay. I'm going to fix your marriage. <gasps> here, here, here is the secret you each get your own toothpaste. One is Crest and the other is Colgate. Don't touch each other's toothpaste, okay? I just saved your marriage, five bucks right there, all right. <laughs> Easiest thing in the world, all right, let's pray. So, <laughs> now wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? But sometimes, you know, it, it really is. Uh, truth is, in marriage, you know, conflict is inevitable. You are going to have conflict because you married another human, all right? Not all humans are the same. You have differences of opinions, you have different ideas and different perspectives. I, I married a human and her name is Shannon. And uh, 10 years ago, we went to this marriage conference. Uh, we were married about six years at the time. And at the time we were big into the show 24. Anybody remember 24, Jack Bauer? We were like binge watching 24 before binge watching was a thing. And so we were, we were watching and we said, you know what, we need to focus on our marriage. Let's take a weekend and go focus on our marriage and no 24. We're just gonna take a break, withdrawal, we're gonna do it though. And so we went and while we were at this conference, uh, the speakers were talking about how conflict is an inevitable part of marriage. You are going to have conflict and that's a normal thing. In fact, about 70% of what couples tend to argue about in their marriage revolves around money, in-laws, sex, and kids. Uh, those tend to create about 70% of all the arguments. How, how many of you would say, yep, I've, I've had that argument? Uh, if your in-laws are here, I'm sorry to make it awkward for you, all right? But, but that tends to be the case. And because those tend to be differences of opinions, many times those conflicts never get resolved. And they went on to talk about how resolving all your conflict is not the path to a healthy marriage because conflict is going to exist. Conflict in your marriage is like blood pressure. You have to have blood pressure, right? Now, if you have too high a blood pressure and the conflict gets too heated and too intense, things rupture. You could have a stroke, you have a heart attack. But if there's no blood pressure, right, what happens? You're dead. There's no blood flowing. And sometimes in relationships, when people just give up and they, they don't ever push back anymore, it's like they're just checked out emotionally. And they say, you know what, I I'm done with this. And maybe you've even seen that with your friendships, right? Apart from marriage, you're just like, yeah, whatever. And, and you say that, well, whatever, and you walk away. And my guess is, is there's probably some of you in this room here today that this is your problem. Uh, there's others of you that are saying, well, if conflict means we got a healthy marriage, we are doing awesome. <laughs> we got plenty of that. And that's the truth is, and so we began to listen uh, to the, the, the conference speakers. We went back to the hotel that night and then the whole next day we we're supposed to go back to the conference. But then I got sick. I got a fever and I started throwing up. And so we wound up spending the next day just binge watching 24 in the hotel room. But, <laughs> uh, but that one piece of advice was really good. You know, that conflict is going to happen. You're going to have it. It is a tension then that you have to learn to manage. And so the goal is not to get rid of all your conflict. The goal is to have conflict, but to have conflict in such a way that you can do so lovingly. And so you have to learn, how can I navigate through my conflicts 
in a loving way. And some of us grew up in families where we didn't have that modeled for us very well, right? We learned really bad patterns of dealing with conflict or avoiding conflict and checking out. Some of us have made real mistakes, but there is hope, all right? And and the way that we learn to navigate the difficulties in relationships is by being aware, just being aware. Now, that's not beware, (laughs) okay? We don't want you to scare you away from marriage, Uh, but being aware. And so here's three principles we're going to talk about today. And you can, you can apply this to your friendships, to your relationships with your parents, whatever, but being spiritually aware, being self-aware, and being relationally aware. Okay. So let's, let's jump in and unpack those three different things. The first thing is to be spiritually aware because we are relational beings. God wants us to be relational. He wants us to have good relationships with other people because that is life-giving. We also need to be spiritually aware that there is an enemy who does not want us to have healthy relationships. Jesus said this about our enemy. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come so that you can have life and have an abundant life. So we've got to be spiritually aware that we have an enemy who is out to destroy all the relationships in our life. And if you are married, you have got to recognize that there is a spiritual enemy who is working to undermine your marriage and to pull it apart and to destroy the foundation of your marriage. He does not want to see your marriage succeed. He does not want to see it flourish. He doesn't want to see you flourish in your marriage either. And he's going to be working against you. Now, some of you, if you're new to church, you're like, oh, great. Here goes the pastor talking about the devil. That's exactly what I'd expect when I come to a church. And that is just a cop-out. But here's the deal. As Christ followers, we do believe that there is a spiritual reality all around us that does influence us. And that there is a spiritual reality. And sometimes I think what happens is we fall into the temptation of thinking that our spouse is the enemy. And that is not the case. We need to be spiritually aware that there is a different enemy that is out to destroy our marriage. They're not the enemy, but the devil is, and evil is. And so one of the best pieces of advice I've heard on marriage is in just how you sit and when you have conversations, if you sit facing each other, sometimes the conflict rests right in between you and you continually just butt heads. But if you were to change your position and just face out together and sit next to each other, like you were in a car heading in the same direction, you could put that conflict out in front of you so that you have a common enemy. Uh, There was a, a really famous rabbi centuries ago that said there is nothing that unites like a common enemy. Nothing unites like a common enemy. You ever seen two parties come together? It's like, oh, did you see that? Oh, yeah, me too. You know, like common enemy, all of a sudden there's unity together. And if you're having conflict in your marriage, maybe one of the best things you can do is sit next to each other on the couch or in your car and put that conflict out in front of you and begin to attack it together instead of attacking each other. Make sense? Okay, so we've got to be spiritually aware to recognize that there is evil that is out to destroy us. But in the same way, we've also got to recognize the great power that we have available to us because God wants us to experience a healthy relationship. He wants us, and he's on our side. So don't get all crazy about the devil. Get crazy about God, that God loves you and wants you to flourish, and he's going to help you. And some of you have not been praying in your marriage. You've not recognized that you need help. (laughs) And some of you are like, yep, you need help, right? And I would encourage you to begin praying together as a couple. And that uh, whole idea might be like scary to you because you don't like to pray out loud. But I would just encourage you, sit together quietly for one or two minutes, just hold each other's hands and pray silently. And just ask God to come into your marriage and help. Say, God, we need your help, you know? And maybe one day you'll get so bold, one of you will peep and be like, help us, you know, whatever, and begin to pray out loud together. And that spiritual awareness will grow in your relationship. So that's the first thing. 
whether it's your friendships, whether it's your marriage, being spiritually aware that God is there to help. He wants you to have an awesome marriage. Second thing is being self-aware. All right? So go ahead and point to yourself. Say it starts here. How many of you have seen the, the show The Middle? It's one of my favorite sitcoms out right now. There's, there's a little guy on there. He's constantly talking to himself. And every once in a while, he'll speak to himself. And uh, this is what I picture. In, in times of conflict in our marriage, just look down, speak to yourself. Be awesome. <laughs> All right? This, being self-aware of what you bring to your relationship is so important. Now, Jesus, Jesus said this. Uh, he says, why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you've got a log in your own eye? Why worry about the speck? So often we tend to find the little specks, the little things that are wrong with other people, and we ignore the glaring weakness that we are bringing to the table. And Rick Warren said this. He says, marriage doesn't cause problems. Marriage actually tends to reveal our problems, right? It, those problems are there, and marriage just puts a magnifying glass on those things. And I learned so much about myself when I got married. And then when I had kids, I learned even more about myself. <laughs> uh, but marriage is like that. And Dan Allender says this. He says, this would be a great way to begin to learn to navigate conflict. He says, in every conflict, no matter how obviously wrong your spouse is, what if you were to bear the log in your own eye and allow your spouse to have the speck in their eye. Meaning, I'm going to own the responsibility in this conflict. I'm going to recognize what I'm bringing to the table. I'm going to recognize the disappointment that I'm bringing or the hurt or the past default settings of how I deal with this stuff. And I'm going to recognize how I'm a part of the problem here. I think if, if both couples, both people in, in a couple were able to do that, you know, the self-awareness would just flood into the relationship. So we all bring, you know, wounds to our relationships, but this is what we're reminded in, in Psalms, that God heals the brokenhearted. That God is the one who binds up our wounds. Some of us bring real wounds into our relationships. Betrayals from the past, words that have cut us really deeply. And we may not even realize that some of the bitterness and the anger that comes out in our conversations is really because of the hurt that we've experienced in the past. Now, I know that in a room like this, there are probably some people who right now are even in really abusive relationships. And I just want to encourage you that we are here as a church to help you walk through that difficulty. And we would not want you to remain in that situation. There is a tremendous amount of grace for us. We bring all kinds of pain uh, to our relationships. It's never completely one-sided, but there are times when things get lopsided and abusive, and that is not okay. But if we will generally have some self-awareness and allow God to work in us as individuals, what that can do for our relationships is absolutely incredible. Third thing is that we need to be relationally aware of what's going on around us. Uh, here, here's a great scripture verse. Uh, and, and maybe you've seen this, maybe you've seen the truth of this show up in some of your relationships. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Have you ever, have you noticed this at play? It, it literally, if you were to open your Bible right to the middle, it opens up to this book called Proverbs. And Proverbs is a book that is filled with all kinds of practical advice like this, that uh, typically if you begin a conversation in a harsh way, you're going to stir up anger. But if you begin a conversation in a really gentle way, watch the tone of your voice, 
Uh, don't be super direct, you know, but just really lead in with like, hey, this is what I've been thinking, and, and you just come in with gentleness. Uh, that will affect your conversation. Dr. John Gottman, who's a, a guy, he does all kinds of research on marriage, says that the way that you begin a conversation will tend to be the way that you end the conversation. And so if you come in really direct and forceful and harsh, it's going to blow up. But if you come in really gently, then you're probably going to have a pretty gentle ending as well. And here's, here's what's interesting, uh, is that there is a warning in the Bible for husbands specifically. So husbands, this is for you. This is for me. Uh, the Bible says that God will not listen to our prayers if we are being harsh with our wives. That is sobering to me because I know there are so many times when I get so defensive, I get so worked up, I get emotional, and, and this is just a man thing, right? Men tend to be emotional or logical, but they cannot be both at the same time. Did you know that this is a physical reality? Like, it, our brains are separated, all right, as men. Men? Your brains are separated. You can be either emotional or logical, but you can't be both at the same time. Here's where women get us, right? Their brains are connected. <laughs> the two hemispheres of their brain literally have uh, synapses that connect the emotional side and the logical side. So they can run circles around us emotionally and logically at the same time. But men, have you ever experienced this, guys? You blow up and you just can't think straight. And you have to take a break. You have to breathe. You have to go for a walk. You have to do whatever. But here's what you need to be mindful of in those moments. You've got to catch your breath and you say, look, I will return to this conversation when I can think straight and I need to cool down. And ladies, if you can give some grace, it's super annoying. I know because we're not as smart as you, apparently. Our brains don't work right the same way. But gentleness can really turn away that wrath if we'll be gentle in that moment. So being relationally aware, I, I tend to notice that I tend to be the most harsh when I'm the busiest. A any of you tend to use all the minutes of your day? <laughs> I turns out every day I use all the minutes, sometimes wisely, sometimes not wisely. But when I'm overly committed and I'm busy and sometimes too busy to have a really good conversation where we can sit down and talk through things and take our time, I tend to get pretty blunt and direct. And that's when I begin to notice that I'm the most tempted to be harsh or when I'm accused of being harsh. And so taking some time to be intentional with that space is really, really important. So starting soft in those conversations. It's just really good practical advice. Uh, this is what Jesus says, uh, that, that when we remain in him and he remains in us, so when we spend time with God, you know what the natural result of that relationship with God is? Is the fruit of what he calls, it's the fruit of his Holy Spirit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. How many of you want more of that in your relationships? <laughs> that would be awesome, right? Now we're talking. And so if you want more gentleness, more goodness, kindness, joy, love, all of those things, that naturally comes, Jesus promises us, when we spend time with him. When we allow his word to dwell within us, that naturally comes out of us. That's part of being a Christ follower. And so that's one of the ways that we grow in our relationship and be self-aware is to spend time with our primary relationship with God. Now, Paul uh, writes this. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, or admirable, or praiseworthy, Think about those things. Don't just dwell on all the things that are going wrong, right? Sometimes that's a downward spiral that happens in, every, in any relationship. I see it in my own marriage. Something goes wrong and I just want to, oh, you know what else? This and you did that and you said it this way and whatever. And it's, I'm not thinking about all the right things, the, the beautiful things, the lovely things, the, you know, all of that. 
It's a change of what we focus on. If we can be faithful to this, then what actually begins to happen is that we begin to express some gratitude in our relationships. And when we express gratitude, not just feel gratitude or think about gratitude, but when we actually express it to each other, it's amazing how life can flood into our relationships, into our friendships. Maybe there's been a difficult friendship that you just, for whatever reason, you just can't seem to get on the same page. You know what's amazing? is if you actually write a note to that person and the only thing you put in that note is what you're grateful for, it can actually heal a lot of wounds. It's amazing what can happen when we actually just take time to express our gratefulness and we live in a place of gratitude. And I know, I don't know, to me, that seems so simplistic, but out of this entire message, this is my personal takeaway is this is where I need to live. This is what I need to focus on with my wife is just being grateful and being thankful for who she is. And maybe as a couple, you do this individually, but you don't do it together. And maybe you could begin, just do a 30-day experiment where together you actually expressed gratitude and you kept a, a gratitude journal together and say, hey, what are we grateful for? My wife says this a lot of times. She says, you are what you celebrate. And if you don't celebrate very much, that's very reflective of your relationship. And so I, I started to take that to heart. I was like, boy, what if we began to celebrate together? What would that look like? And, and the stories that we tell about our marriage together, how would that flood life and joy into our relationship? Um, you know, I, 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 I know that there are so many people, when, when you hear this message, you hear, be awesome. Maybe what comes to your mind is all the times when you've not been awesome. When maybe, maybe a friendship went sour and you know it was because of something you did, uh, that you were anything but awesome. And I want you to hear from, I, I just want you to hear from the front that you are forgiven and that there is love and that there is grace. There is hope. There is a new start available. One of the beautiful things that we have as Christ followers is the hope of eternity, that we will have relationships, that we can rebuild, that healing and forgiveness can bring us new hope into all of our relationships. And so the last thing I want you to walk away with today is feeling more defeated or more shame-filled because you've not been awesome. And I do want to encourage you that God wants you to experience love and meaning and joy in your relationships. I think this woman, and let me just close on this. Uh, there was a woman years ago uh, that talked about her relationship that she had with her husband. She got married. All of her friends said, hey, look, this guy is bad news. You don't want to marry him. She ignored him. She married him anyway. And then one week after getting married, she realized, oh, no. <laughs> this was a terrible decision. This guy is, he's, he's really difficult. He's incredibly controlling and uh, just a, a lot of the relationships in his life were, were really difficult. And so they went on for several years and she really lived in a marriage that was pretty unfulfilled. And so she made up in her mind she was gonna get a divorce. And she said, you know what? I'm gonna live the next nine months in my marriage and I'm gonna be the ideal partner. I'm gonna be the ideal perfect wife so that when I do get divorced, I will have a clean conscience. It was his fault. And so she made this list. This is what an ideal wife would do. You know, I'm gonna do all of his clothes. I'm gonna make lunch. I'm gonna make dinner for him. I'm gonna write encouragement notes and put it in his lunchbox. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do all kinds of romantic things and everything so that at the end of the day, he's, he just is like, wow, she is the perfect wife. And then I'm gonna leave. And so she made this list. And then she set about over the next nine months to be the ideal wife. And she started doing all this and she started um, just doing all kinds of crazy, you know, romantic things. At about month six, six, she said something shifted. Her husband began to notice something was different in their relationship. And he's like, why are you having all the fun? And he actually started to reciprocate. He started to do things too. And then she was like, oh, I'll show him. And so she started to be even more of an ideal wife. And then she said, finally, I got to month nine when I had decided I was going to divorce him. And something shifted in my mind as I began to reflect 
on my relationship with God, and I, and I began to think, this is not right in my own heart. She said, but something bigger shifted. She said, I actually began to love him genuinely <laughs> from my heart because I had been loving him for the last nine months. I actually started to have fun in our relationship. Our relationship uh, began to grow in ways that I never expected. And they went on to have a long, long, happy marriage, very happily married together. And she said it was because of that decision that she made to say, I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to have fun, whether or not he returns it or not. And she said there were stretches in our marriage where he never returned the favor. He never returned the love. But I was just having too much fun myself. And I genuinely loved him. And I think that is the love of God. That is how God loves us. God has every reason to send us away because we're not perfect. We don't perfectly return our love to him. And he loves us anyway. He loves us in spite of. And I think God delights himself to, lo to love us and to show us grace and forgiveness and to always welcome us here. And so I want to just encourage you, if you're, if you're married here today, you're, if you're with your spouse, just hold their hand and I, let's pray together. And if you're not married and you're like, okay, this is super awkward right now, uh, I want you to, this is your moment to pray for the married, married couples here because they need, we need your prayers. And let's pray. God, your love never fails. It never gives up. We need that love in our marriages. So we invite your presence to come into our marriage. We ask you to heal broken hearts. Bind up wounds. I pray for the, the couples here, Lord, that you would just give them an extraordinary amount of grace and may joy be evident in their relationship. Give them new hope where they need new hope. And Father, for those who are here uh, that maybe have a bad taste in their mouth, I just pray that you would refresh them with your love and that you would minister to each person. In Jesus' name, amen.